I'm Aaron Sagers, and this is Talking Strange. Hey there, spooky nerds, and welcome to Talking Strange, the paranormal pop culture show with Den of Geek. I'm your host, journalist, author, researcher of weird things, Aaron Sagers. You can also catch me on 28 Days Haunted on Netflix and Paranormal Caught on Camera on Travel Channel, Discovery Plus, and the Max streaming service. And hey, we're now filming our seventh season, which is very exciting news, so check that out. And I am excited to bring in my guest today. He's, of course, very well known in paranormal media and the paranormal community. He's the friendly face behind the Paranormal 60 podcast, star of Travel Channel and Discovery Plus's hit TV series, The Holzer Files, as well as Ghosts of Devil's Perch. You've seen him on Paranormal State, Ghost Adventures, uh, in Shock Docs, The Curse of Lizzie Borden, and Demon in the White House. And since childhood, he has been on a wild ride of haunted houses, creature sightings, even a few UFO encounters. And he's not just a casual observer. He's getting out there. He's diving headfirst in the paranormal, investigating claims, exploring the most haunted spots worldwide. And on a personal note, he's been a longtime friend to me. Maybe that's don't judge him poorly because of that. And he's one of the first folks to welcome me into the paranormal community. And I consider him a brother and a good friend. And it's always a pleasure to speak with him about his newest work. And that includes this book, Theater of the Mind, Tales from the Darkness. It's available now. And my guest, of course, is Mr. Dave Schrader. Dave. Aaron, thank you for that amazing opening. And what what a great bio. Do you mind if I use that on my website going forward? I think that's a good idea. Hey, yeah. I, you know what? I actually uh, I kind of tweaked the bio a little bit. So it wasn't just reading what you had sent me. It was actually making it a little more personal. Which is what's on my website. I just copied and pasted and sent it to you. So, <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I'm doing my best. You know, it's it's all I've got is just my little, uh, little bits on there. Although I am considering legally changing my name. I think I've been in the business long enough, like Prince, that I can get by with now wanting to be known as the artist of, uh, how, how did I want to phrase this? Um, uh golden telly award-winning international tv sensation dave schrader i like that maybe you could be the ghost of the award-winning international paranormal sensation dave schrader the ghost i don't know what that symbol i'm still alive i don't want to wouldn't that just be like a ghost face with like a little cross hanging down yeah kind of like prince's signal yeah well you have I, the... I'm trademarking that i don't want to see it on your nerdy ghost store now did you hear me? I, well, with that in mind, we have a lot to get to, but with that in mind, I, I was thinking about uh, the the early days of paranormal community and paranormal events and the darkness events, which you started and really launched the kind of the paranormal tourism movement and all of these paracons. But back in the early days, Dave for Darkness Radio, his previous radio show, he had this this kind of illustration of him and surrounded by all these these paranormal creatures and whatnot and then later on i launched paranormal pop culture i'm saying this on the record too now and i was truly authentically thought i was coming up with a new idea of aaron uh, in sort of a men in black outfit surrounded by all these paranormal entities and creatures and it still took a while for me to be like shit <laughs> <laughs> i think but but i wasn't the only one because then i saw like you you're kind of looking out there it's like i think a lot of people maybe unintentionally or intentionally were inspired by slash <clears throat> ripping off dave schrader's original illustration <laughs> yeah when we uh when we first began doing paranormal radio shows my old friend from high school is a graphic artist and i i leaned in him i said dan I'm doing this. Would you create an image for me? And he created a cool caricature of me and my former co-host, Tim. And then we did. We were surrounded by Bigfoot, Loch Ness Monster, you know, aliens, graveyards. We even had orbs in our little image. 
and uh, we rode that for a while. And then when Tim was let go from the show at the uh, at the station we were at, I kept hoping he was going to get brought back on. But after a year of being gone, I, I removed him and had him turned into a ghost looking out from behind a gravestone. And uh, then all of a sudden, everybody started having images that were themselves in the center surrounded by caricatures of, of monsters. So uh, we eventually just swapped it up and I, we became the, the skull logo that has been with me for, I think, a little over a decade now. Yeah. And is literally emblazoned on your flesh in the form of yes. a tattoo. That yeah, there correct. you go. It's yeah. And they never put the name of the radio show on there because I always felt like that was like tattooing your girlfriend's name on you never goes well. So I just stuck with the, the logo and ended up leaving darkness radio anyway. So yeah. see, I was right not to have that emblazoned on me. Now I'm the host of the paranormal 60 podcast. So it all works out well. Yeah. Well, I've thought about in the various TV adventures that we've had at one point, like uh, the paranormal paparazzi, you know, it was not not an especially exciting logo, but it was like such a big kind of, you know, the shot, you know, it was like the big thing. I'm like, I, I might get this logo like, you know, tattooed on me. So glad I didn't after one season, eight, eight episodes later. But, <laughs> <laughs> but, but let's talk about I mean, talk about cool designs. The Theater of the Mind cover for those of you that are are listening to this as an, as an audio program, you can check it out on Amazon, on Dave's site, and and on YouTube, where we're airing this. But I love this illustration. And the book itself is, we've got like 15, 16 stories of strange, unusual. We're covering a lot of ground in this. Mm -hmm. And it, having known you for so long, there's some stories I kind of recognize from our chats and seeing some of mm -hmm. your presentations, and then a lot that I had not heard before. So after years of people calling into your various programs, interacting with people out of at events and and collecting all these stories, what really made you want to assemble this into book form? Uh, cash, really. That's all it is. I'm uh, a money whore. Uh, no, listen, I had been taking these stories, curating these stories and sharing them. And people were always like, man, I wish I was in a book. I'd love to share that story with with other people and do this and do that. And so many people would write in these great little stories to me, but um, they would be just, you know, quickly hammered out on a on a, a keyboard and not much detail put into it. And I thought there's got to be a better way to present these stories. So I would recraft the story, leaving all of the essentials in place. But because at the time I was doing it for a radio show with my darkness radio program, I had created theater of the mind where we would take these stories and I would flesh them out. So it wasn't just Aaron walked down the street and saw that it would be Aaron could feel the, the stones beneath his feet crunch as he walked through the wo woods, the sounds of birds surrounding him as a gentle breeze. So I give some of that context so that Tim could create sound effects as the program went on. Um, but then I had like, I've got about 150 of these stories that, you know, and you'll see throughout each one of the books, I'll be including some of my own personal accounts. But I um, I thought it's stupid to just let these kind of languish and not do something with them. So uh, with the permissions of people, I started putting them together into these book forms. And I wanted to make it not just a book of ghost stories, because really good campfire stories aren't just ghost stories. They're monsters. They're missing people their ufo encounters so that's what i really wanted to mix into this and and i went with some of the heavy hitters black eyed kids the bloody bones man who i think we introduced on our show uh darkness radio back in the day um ghosts ufos alien encounters and time slip phenomena so i really wanted to kind of give a nice kind of overview of the strange and the supernatural showing that it's more than just one element and giving people more things to consider so putting them into that form was the way i felt would be the best way to make it available and and let people kind of come into my world and i could go into theirs and you know be uncle dave narrating and sharing these stories the when you talk about these stories and, and you kind of touched on this mm -hmm. it's a lot of these these stories that we hear and even the ones that we might experience it's not always these big significant ones it's like mm -hmm. i was in this uh, place and i heard footsteps and then that's the end of the story mm -hmm. what was sort of your benchmark for inclusion because even though you kind of added some of the the literary flair and fleshing right. some of the details out 
you could have easily it would have been hard to just have a book of like i heard footsteps and that was it so were you looking for certain things within each story that would really translate to the page yeah the meat all had to be there it had to be something that you could look at and oh this is a story and this is a good story um and that's not demeaning other people's experiences because sometimes people just wanted to share on our show and they wanted to be heard. So I would read the paragraph long experience and weigh in on what we thought it was or what it meant, or just giving them a chance to be a sounding board. So in some of those stories that it was just a few sentences or a paragraph, and there wasn't enough contextual information to build upon those just will live in that little pocket universe. The ones that came to me that were two or three pages long and they just needed some grammar and punctuation fix and, and a little bit of um, more descriptors. Uh, so again, I, nothing I write or add to the stories influences or changes the beginning, middle or end of any one of these stories. It's just fleshing out more of, of the, tactile experience the theater of the mind element so that it's not just yeah we got in the car and drove to the place you know it was a warm summer day as we drove down the highway and you know i'd look at what the date was they'd give me june 11th 1985 so it's pretty fair to assume it was a nice summer day as we drove down this highway and blah 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 you know so it's just those little bits but if i could just throw in a couple little flourishes to give the story more character and, and still present their story without mucking it up. And I always gave it back to them saying, what do you think of this? And they're like, perfect. That's it's scary in some instances, Dave, because it's like you were there with me. You're, you're so dead on with the descriptors. And that's what I decided to move forward with. So it was just kind of putting these stories together in a way that made them entertaining, educational, fun, uh, creepy. And even in some of the stories that are not straight out scary, to me, some of the, the thought, and some of the process behind the stories are what are unnerving or unsettling because you read it on a whole, like the very first story uh, that we do is kind of a time slip story. And it's, I think it's fascinating all the way through, but at the end, it's more of like that. Wow. What really is going on in the world around us? Is it as cut as dry as dead and alive or space and earth, or are there other elements we're missing out on? And that's what I love is encouraging people to think beyond the boundaries of what we've been raised to believe. Well, you said every story kind of has a beginning, middle and end, and that is always important. But the other thing, and I don't know if this was intentional, but it comes through, is the people at the heart of the stories. You do a nice job of we, we learn about them as individuals. And then there's this sense, even though it's not necessarily explicitly stated, but these people are altered. They're changed by these experiences. So it's not mm -hmm. just, I saw the scary thing. You kind of get this notion of, and then I was a different person as a result. Mm -hmm. So, right. It, and you'll notice too, that very few of the stories have uh, a name for the protagonist because some of the people were like, I, I want this story shared. I want to get this out of my soul. Um, but I don't want you to tell people who I am. Uh, because some of them are, you know, military or doctors and lawyers and firefighters and people that they don't want this story associated with their name, but they really wanted a place to kind of give this story. So I, I always maintain wh where they allow me to use their names, their names are involved in the stories where they don't, you'll see, I just never address the name of the person who's speaking throughout the entire story. Um, we'll address and, and I've changed some of the brother or sister names just to make it, you know, extra layer of protection. But everything else about the story is the way they they intended it and wanted it to be shared. We cover a lot of grounds in the book from UFOs to ghosts, doppelgangers or future ghosts or whatever mm -hmm. some, that one thing was to strange visitors and overall WTF kind of creatures. The. I, I'm kind of thinking in terms of like. A storyteller or uh, stories are kind of like currency in a way uh, or yeah. or this really collectible card or comic or whatever. And right. you you feel privileged to have it in your possession. But sometimes you could be a little bit stingy, not wanting to share it too much. You know, it loses right. some of that value if you show it around too much. Were there any stories that you were like, this is a good story, but I don't know if I really want to put this in there because... I kind of want to keep it for me or hold back a little bit. 
Well, no, I, here's, here's really kind of the Genesis point for this, Aaron is when COVID hit and I was maybe two months into the lockdown, I was just kind of going bonkers and not knowing what our future held, or even if I had a future being an older guy and, you know, overweight. And at that point we were hearing it, you know, people in their fifties and with any kind of weight issue or this, you were dead, you were as good as cooked. Right. So it was like, Oh man. So I just decided to start hammering out and I wrote like 125 page book of my own experiences. And I was thinking, you know, people have always been on me to kind of share and and get more detailed. So here's what I've created. I, however, uh, deal with severe insecurity, uh, shyness, and um, something called the uh, imposter syndrome. So I get done writing it and it just beat me to the ground that I was so, nobody's going to want to read this. Nobody's going to, and and it, it sat there languishing and I'm like, well, I'll have it for my kids. They'll always have these stories of dad's encounters. Um, but then I thought, well, I've got all these other books, all these other stories that I can't hold on to. I can't keep them to myself as a collectible. Like you said, I really want to show them off and I want to give them a place to showcase so that people like you and I don't have to feel alone. We don't have to feel like we're the only one on the planet that's ever had a weird experience. And I learned early on in my career, not to dismiss a story because of how weird it sounds because black eyed kids, let's face it. When we first heard it sounded ridiculous, like an urban legend, but it took on a life of its own. And people from around the world started opening up and sharing encounters from many different eras in time, the bloody bones, man, uh, many different creatures and ghost like encounters. And it's been surprising to me. And I've kept, I almost kind of want to put out an, a, a book someday of these beautiful emails that I've gotten from people that have written into me to say how that story or this encounter helped their lives because they thought they were the only one that ever saw this. And they might've even been suicidal, believing they were crazy for seeing or hearing these things. And now they know they're not alone and that there are other people out there. So I've been holding some of my stories back, not out of not wanting to share them, but more out of just the the insecurities. But I figured, well, I can sprinkle a couple of my stories into each book. And if people like them and they're not like, Hey, the book was great, except for Dave's story sucked. You know, as long as I'm not getting that feedback, then I thought, well, what I'll do is I will give the more comprehensive book. Um, the, that will be my story with a lot more detail, a lot more stories that I've never shared publicly or openly, or have only touched on. So I'm still crafting that book on the side, but I'm, I'm continuing with this theater of the mind series. I'd like to, I think I've got enough stories to do five or six volumes of what I think are the a material stories. Um, and then I've got some that are B, B and C levels that I have to reevaluate, reexamine and see if they're, you know, I don't want to put out subpar, uh, things and that's no slight on the people that wrote them, but many of them didn't write them with the intention of having them seen, in a book form, I may just send those stories back and say, Hey, I'd, you know, I'd love to involve this. Is there any more detail you'd like to give me? And then give that chance for them to rebreathe life into those stories. That was a quick, you know, I heard Dave talking about these flying beasts. And when I was a kid, I saw one, I just want to fire Dave. When I was 12, I saw one of those when I was at a Y camp retreat and blah, blah, blah. And they give me a nice chunk, but they don't fully realize the story. And maybe given that little push, they'll give me more that I can share and and deliver. Cause we've got a lot of great stories over 18 years of doing this. Even some of the one sentence or one paragraph stories have some really great contextual feeling and emotion to them that I think are important for people to hear. Um, but we'll see, we'll see how that all plays out. But the, I'm like you, I grew up reading and reading comic books and reading books and a lot of those stories, sometimes you go back and you reread those books and they're kind of dated. Um, I wanted to give people something new, something fresh to read and and maybe a different take on some of these versions of the stories than they've ever heard before. And yeah, just backtracking a little bit, I like what mm -hmm. what you were saying about this, reading these stories, hearing these stories. It kind of makes people feel a little less crazy. Mm -hmm. And and then especially with some of the more bizarre ones like black eyed kids or black and and bloody bones man things like that it kind of speaks to sort of the 
the kind of the structure that people still try to apply to even the paranormal and the unexplained. I think we've experienced this throughout the years that we've been doing this throughout the 20 years that, you know, you've been doing a radio show. The sense of, OK, ghosts, sure, I'm on board with ghosts. Ghosts are uh, weird. Cool. OK, uh, yeah, you know, UFOs. OK, yeah, yeah, they're probably out there. Bigfoot, maybe, maybe, you know, and then you introduce something like interdimensional beings or black eyed kids. They're like, oh, hell no, that's weird. I don't know. That just sounds crazy. It, it, we we encounter this, you know, maybe less so now, but people trying to apply structure and rules to the unexplained and paranormal, whereas that's not really what our experiences kind of reflect. I learned that lesson uh, very harshly once by Rosemary Ellen Guiley. I was having her come on to talk. She had released a book, an encyclopedia of fairies, folk, you know, fairy folk and such. And uh, I was kind of off air joking around with her. And I'm like, yeah, I've never touched on this stuff. It's always been so ridiculous to me. She goes, so let me, let me get this straight. Ghosts, Bigfoot, Chupacabra, Loch Ness Monster, aliens coming down and anal probing us. You're all in. You'll buy into those. But the concept that these beings, which predate many ghost stories and many of these other beings, it's too far-fetched for you to believe. And I'm like, well, you know, you, you say fairies and people start thinking of Tinkerbell. And she goes, and describe Tinkerbell to me. And I said, well, she's this beautiful little fairy who helps out. And she goes, no, Tinkerbell is an evil little bitch. And that is what fairies are. They are these temperamental little beings that if you screw with them or their world, they will screw with you back. And she goes, everybody thinks so highly of Tink because she's this pretty little thing, this little pixie. But she she turned on Peter. She turned on the Lost Boys. She joined up with, P with Captain Hook at one point to help him because she was petty. She tried to kill Wendy. And that's kind of the real story behind fairies. So they Disney wasn't giving us a sanitized version. And that really just kind of hit me. And I was like, wow, that's that's an interesting element. So let's let's look into that story. And I started taking it a lot more seriously. And then going overseas and hearing people and talking to people and having them share their stories. And sometimes we would tell a ghost story and the locals would roll their eyes at us, but then they would tell an equally eye rolling story about their encounter with the banshee or with uh you know we people as they call them and they are serious and they were building in their their yard they had to end up moving fields and everything around a fairy fortress or a fairy uh garden or things that they had found out in their their property and i'm like just till it over oh no you don't want to do that no no and they were dead serious and they would go on to tell me what could happen to you and what they'd seen happen to others that just plowed over fairy villages or fairy circles or, you know, troll mounds. And then I started reading news stories from around the world where I think it was like Denmark or Iceland, they were building this brand new highway system and they had to stop. And then they're like, we got to do a vote on this. We didn't realize we're going right into a troll hill. And yes. We need to move this around. And I'm like, it's the 21st century. You're what? You got to do what? You got to move around a troll hill. But that's how serious it is. So, I think it's really a cool element to let your mind be open to all of these different elements that even if they're things that don't speak to you right now, sometimes people have come around and gone, I always thought I was having an alien encounter. But after hearing Rosemary Ellen Guiley, I wonder if it's more of one of these elementals or fey folk because our property is shared with a forest preserve behind us. And as they're encroaching on this forest preserve, more activity is taking place in our house. And these beings look like orcs and trolls and gnomes. And oh, wow, isn't that kind of a cool paradigm shift? Opening your mind and not just saying, no, it doesn't fit the paradigm of what my belief structure is. So therefore, it cannot exist. Maybe they all coexist. Maybe they're all elements of the same thing. So let's examine it as a whole. Yeah. And I, I mean, you're definitely speaking my language here. This is, this is the kind of stuff that really excites me these days. And, and I'll just say for reference for anyone that is not familiar with Rosemary Allen Guiley, I would strongly suggest looking her up, picking up as many books as you can. She sadly passed away in 2019. And, and it was funny. Like I, for anyone that's heard the, the word jinn or learned about jinn and is not of the Islamic faith, I would argue that Rosemary Allen Guiley is really one of the people that brought this concept into two Western audiences and started introducing it into the mainstream. 
and and actually that was that was one of the last um communications i had with her was uh the the live action aladdin movie was coming out with will smith the, the live action disney adaptation and i was just chatting with her about you know the how we got from gin to blue genies and whatnot and i was connecting all the dots and um and she was uh, as typical very lovely and great to talk to but also was like nope like i had enough problems with jen this is one thing that i can't help you on aaron um but uh so she she's a great one and i would say check out her work and it's i think i think what you're saying dave is I love it because when you really remove the labels of certain things, and again, humans, we like to have order. We like to put things in a box that we can explain and understand the ingredients of whatever we're dealing with. But when you remove the labels and you just look at the phenomena itself, we see so many crossovers across cultures throughout the world that one creature, one uh, culture skinwalker might be another culture's werewolf or vampire or whatever, or shapeshifter, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's so fascinating when you start peeling back those labels. And I think you're really kind of touching on a lot of that in this book. It's not always like it's not hitting you over the head or explicit, but it's definitely the ideas are are there with it. That said, when you deal with something like the Bloody Bones Man. What do you think? What do you personally think is going on with some of these stranger characters that. We don't know truly what they're their mentality or mission or what they're aiming to do but it certainly seems like there's this mischief to put it lightly this threatening kind of um vibe that accompanies them what do you think is going on with some characters like that i wish i knew i you know I, I liken it to the people that are like well what do you what do you tell skeptics i'm like what do you mean what do i, I just tell them my experience but if they don't believe you i don't care I don't care. I, this is my experience. This is my information. And there may be things in their life that are very real that I couldn't believe because I'm like, no, that would never happen to somebody. Right. And it may be that they won three back-to-back -back lottery scratch-offs because that's impossible. What are the odds that that person, or you meet somebody like an Elizabeth saint who was struck not once, not twice, but three times by lightning. Right. And you start looking at these aspects of who people are and you're like, well, just because that story doesn't make sense to me, doesn't mean that it is not a very real experience for these other people. Um, and, and yeah, I've totally broken my mindset into needing to have one explanation for this, this, this ghosts are many things. Ghosts are memories, memories that are in us that are projected out at times during maybe times of crisis. Ghosts are, uh, maybe memories of a location that are being projected out in a time of whatever, right? Ghosts may be that physical form separated from the ethereal form and the ethereal form still wishing to stay here. Or it may be s small peaks through the veil of time and space as we just happen to rub against that one moment in time that's overlapping. And we're seeing these like waves in a pond, right? That, that reflect back and forth. And sometimes we're just on the right wave as they crash together to see both realities coexist for a moment. Maybe it's that we're leaving fractals and pieces of ourselves behind in locations. When you grew up as a child, you had no responsibilities and so much fun and you could play and just all the energy and happiness of the family or maybe it's a much more tragic story and there's elements of abuse and and we leave those pieces those those fractals of ourselves in a location that may resonate with the next resident who's going through something similar so therefore they're kind of picking up on like a magnet they're picking up and, and attracting those memories and those flashes so i think there's a, a wide variety of things that we're actually dealing with and i'm looking into more and going to be working with some scientists on a couple of really intriguing aspects of what i think electronic voice phenomena might be and you know before it was like we're obviously recording voices but from where and, I, you know, I've got some concepts that I wanted to talk and I've spoken to a couple of neurosurgeons and um, neuroscientists, rather, and a few other people that uh, have an interesting way of looking at things that we're going to put to test some of these ideals and see if we can come up with maybe something that would force science to look at it a little bit more seriously. 
I that's why I love Bill Chapel and Bill Chapel's work so much because Bill he's obviously you know this but he's he's developed these devices where it seems like we're getting some voices or getting some interaction from something somewhere but he's very reluctant to say oh i think it's a ghost and so he's like i don't know what we're dealing with instead right. or or push him a little bit more he's like i think it's us or a version mm -hmm. of us out there but yeah i i i like that again i i'm not surprised but we're very much on the same page of when I ask you to define what a ghost is, your definition tells me more about you and your philosophy than what an actual whatever a ghost is and right. and about your cultural upbringing and maybe spiritual beliefs and things like that. That said, I I sometimes look at fiction and I know you're a big nerd as well. I look at comic books. I look at science fiction, uh, you, you, various movies, maybe even a Pixar movie. And sometimes I'm like, man, that piece of fiction I don't think intentionally, but the writers kind of tapped into something that feels right to me as far as a theory or philosophy. And mm -hmm. with something like the Bloody Bones Man, I don't know exactly if this is the case, but it automatically takes me to something like Monsters, Inc. What if there's some sort of entity that does feed off of like emotions, strong emotions, and maybe in that case, it's it's fear or whatever. But have you ever thought about that? Like thought about how pop sure. culture kind of might be locking on to certain ideas that could be truer than they even realize. Yeah. And and I also like to look at, you know, people ask me, are you afraid? I, I don't like to use the, the word fear because I feel that gives power to something. And I will say there are moments I'm shocked. There are moments that I am frightened, but it doesn't mean I walk in a place of fear. I've elected this career to go to places to try to confront monsters, myths, legends. And sometimes I'm shocked that, holy shit, this is, this is real. Right. But I don't walk in that, that step of, Oh my God, what if I do? Oh, oh what was that? What? You know, it's, and I understand, well, Dave, I've watched you on TV. You do that. What is this? What is that? Well, because we're responding to something we, we heard that was dramatic and freaked us out, but we charge towards it nine times out of 10, right? We want to understand what's going on. So I just think that, you know, we need to look at the way things are done and look at the other perspectives. Um, you know, they, the book Wicked is a great book to consider. It takes and reimagines the story of the Wicked Witch of the West and realizes that maybe there's more behind her story to why she is what she is the bloody bones man now obviously the original incarnations of this being and i've only i put the name of the creature together with these beings that are being seen maybe unfairly and unjustly uh perhaps even racistly because you know it's they're both described as men that look like their skin has been taken off and they're just kind of the freddy krueger look without a shirt right um so i'm just lumping them into one uh deal but what if what if the bloody bones man is the father of a, a young boy that was, he lost in a fire and he rushed back in to try to find that boy and passed away. And what if the reason that so many young men see the bloody bones man and that he'll climb into bed and be laying next to them non-sexually, but there is because he's trying to connect with his own son, giving the fact that from our perspective, it's terrifying, not realizing the effect of what is it there for? What does it represent? Maybe it's, you know, the Lex Luthor is the hero of his story. Superman is the threat. Superman is this omnipotent being from another planet that's impervious to everything but kryptonite. Why are we giving him so much freedom? His concern is a real concern, but because it doesn't align with ours, he is therefore wrong. So sometimes in looking at these spiritual entities and these beings, we may ascribe something to it out of a place of fear as opposed to a place of, of understanding. And when I look at how many times um, I hear these stories, they're terrifying. And you read the story about the Bloody Bones Man. That's a freaky, freaky story. But what if there is a backstory to why this being is there? What if it is just a father trying to reconnect with uh, something or someone that reminds him of his son? It's unfortunate this this is the way he looks. But because nobody's walked away with bite marks or scratch marks or, you know, having something more dramatic happen, all we can do is guess. So I lean into the fact that I've been bitten on screen. I've been 
uh, smacked in the back. I've split my back open, being pushed backwards into a room. So I've had these experiences in where it would be very easy for me to run. Being the father of 11 kids and having been there for the last, you know, 40 years as a dad, watching children grow up, sometimes I realize these spirits are acting like a, a child that just wants to be heard. And they're lashing out. And sometimes they do something to hurt you to get your attention. And they don't really mean to hurt you or terrify you. But they're so frustrated. And they're so, I just want someone to hear me. And then once I get them to calm down, and I've, I've tried talking to them almost like children in the ghost to devil's perch, when we finally faced up against this one kind of really big presence, it knocked me on my ass, frightened our camera crew, our producer and director. And they wanted to just pull me out of there. And I'm like, no, this is what we're here for. And I spun and I, I spoke to it like a child. No, this is not how this does. You don't do this to people. I'm here because I care and I want to know your story. So instead of you striking me, instead of you shoving me or pushing me or trying to frighten us out of here, tell me what I can do to help you. And I got a beautiful, in my opinion, a beautiful EVP. I just get this man's voice almost cry out, remember. And as we dug a little further, we uncovered this man that died. That was a big part of what Butte, Montana was. And this man's been lost to history. He made headlines at the time of his life and death, and nobody's talked about him or remembered him since. So now we give word and meaning to his life again. And I'm happy to say that a lot of the really negative things that were taking place in Butte have stopped. Doesn't mean that the paranormal activities died down completely, but that element, that chapter has been ended. So I like to just try to give spirit the chance that, okay, now that you've lashed out, now that this is it, Let's readdress what can I do for you? I'm not running away. I'm I mean, I also for- I also wonder like with some of these things when people report being um pushed or scratched mm-hmm. or whatever, if whatever it is we're dealing with, maybe there's not a, a true awareness or control over the kind of force that they're exerting. So it's sort of right. uh, to relate in a very kind of mundane way of like if you've ever Uh, been at a restaurant and maybe you're picking up like a a glass and you pick it up expecting to be a certain weight but instead it's a very light plastic glass you're like oh like it you you exerted the the force in incorrectly you know not the force as in um uh the the jedi but i'm working on that too but maybe they're not but you may not be wrong on that either what if Dave Schrader is resonating more at the magnetic frequency of the spirit. And he's so used to trying to get somebody's attention that they're not picking. It's like a gentle breeze to them, but he comes at me and my resonance is at a point where I can feel and sense and am more affected or impacted by that element. So I I think there is a lot to that. And, you know, here you even say it, I, you know, I'm not talking about just Jedi, but obviously what George Lucas created is a very real thing. There is a force in our universe. Science talks about it. History talks about it. That may be how one civilization could be influencing and communicating with another civilization, a half a world apart, as they build and construct things that if we just give it into humanity may just have been a lot smarter than we're giving it credit for. Maybe in a point when we weren't so distracted by television and radio and and cell phones, that consciousness had a different power. And when a an, an awareness came to these beings in Egypt, in the Amazon, all of a sudden their awareness came to being. And in a way, they were picking up ideas. And I know that sounds very woo-woo, but how many of you have thought of something really cool and you're like, man, I wish we could create this. And then all of a sudden, six m- months later, you see it out in the marketplace. Oh, that guy stole my idea. No. They took action upon the idea that they were given quicker than you did. Well, I so uh, yeah, I agree with that, and I, I I love that I as a concept, and and trust me, I talk about the uh, Star Wars connected to the paranormal all the time because there's I think a lot happening under the hood there that might actually be relevant to whatever is going on here. Um, but uh, one of my questions I actually did have was you know with social media and all the concentrated focus on on spooky stuff and weird stuff and creepy pasta or whatever. 
if you think we're kind of generating more activity, and I don't really want to say egregores or tulpas, I don't think it's necessarily that, or maybe it is that, but that we're just either tuning in more or bringing, stirring the stuff up, the silt from the bottom of the, the ocean. I think there's elements to all of that that's very true. Um, I think we do give life to thought and concepts. And I think that we are given gifts of thoughts and concepts that if we act upon it could have a great influence in our life. And if we don't and see other people that did, we can see where we misstepped, right? So you're right. Uh, thinking about things can make them real. I'm a firm believer of that, right? I was seven years old in a garage recording radio shows on a Kmart tape recorder because I wanted to be in radio. I didn't get into radio for another 30 years, right? But I set that inten intention, that manifestation, and came to realize it. Uh, other weird elements. Look, I, I joke about this all the time, but it's, listen, I had some crushes growing up like you did of movie actresses and movie stars, right? Kelly Maroney from Night of the Comet and Fast Times at Ridgemont High. Holy cats, she's gorgeous. I had such a massive crush on her. Turns out she's into the paranormal and we became friends online and we actually hung out at the Queen Mary together and investigated. And Aaron, uh, uh, oh God, not my mind, Aaron Gray, Gray right, yeah. from Silver Spoons and Buck Rogers. Could you ask for a more beautiful human being, both in physicality and, and just overall presence? She comes along as a guest of chip coffees to one of my events at the Queen Mary and we become friends. And, uh, you know, it's it's just interesting to me that these things that I focused on as a child found their way to me much later in life, and maybe not in the way I had hoped when I was 15 or 16, but I get to share the air with that person and that space with that person. And, you know, uh, Jennifer Runyon, who was on Charles in Charge, she's the gorgeous blonde at the beginning of the first Ghostbusters movie, we're friends and exchange messages I, there's another huge actress from the eighties, nineties, and today's who has reached out and is a fan of the shows I've been a part of. And I, you know, I won't mention the name because it's, it's very weird to me still, but it's just like, look at these people I've brought into my world and, and not just them, other actors and actresses and people that I really idolized and, and found an interest in found a way into my circle or I found a way into theirs in a very natural way. And it's so cool, right? Because that means there is magic in the universe around us and that we are creating reality bubbles. We just have to learn to string those bubbles together and pay attention to them. And, and we'll see those things come to light. So, you know, I, I, put this out there too. And I've been very open and you know, my story being a huge Bruce Springsteen fan and feeling like his music saved my life in the 1980s when I was despondent and tried to commit suicide um, as an adult. And I, I have both screen caps saved. I'm so beyond thrilled with one day. I just typed on Facebook. Okay. Universe. I'm putting this out there. Put me in the path of Bruce Springsteen. And lo and behold, I think it was two years later, almost almost to the date. I think within like 15 days of when I put that out there, I was on a flight to California to go meet Bruce Springsteen and get an autographed book and a photograph with him. And part of the pressure is when you meet your, your hero, what do you say to somebody? What do you, what could you possibly say to them? That's interesting, important or whatever. And it just, that's a stressor. And I get to go meet this guy. And I'm told you have five seconds with Bruce Springsteen. And I'm like, okay. And I get up there. He shakes my hand, looks me in the eyes. And I just said, your music saved my life. And he looked at me and he said, good. That's real good. Well, I'm glad you're here. And thank you for coming to see me. And he put his arm around me and we got a picture together. And my biggest fear was, what if I ever meet him? And I have nothing to say. I got to say it all in one sentence. But two years apart from putting it out to the universe, I met Bruce Springsteen. That's bonkers to me. It's definitely been it's a, a long, strange trip. This whole this whole ride and a yeah, pretty right. beautiful one too. I 
Do you they think can't, with you just have to pay attention? That's what so many people wall themselves off in despair and anguish. And I do as well at times. And you just sit there and think, God, nothing goes right. And and I like to think that maybe it's gone right, just not in the way you thought it should. Maybe the reason that a, a boundary was put up or stopped in this moment is something you can't see right now, but maybe that person was really going to be damaging to you in the long run, or that job was going to, you know, collapse and cost you your credibility in the long run. Maybe there are other elements you cannot see. So it's best to accept the situation that you're in today. And instead of wallowing about how it's limited you find the next opening and that's what you have to do. I think there's something really quite special and beautiful about this particular kind of job that we do or, or, or those that kind of pursue this as a hobby, a pursuit and, and enthusiasm. Uh, it kind of, I've started thinking that all this time spent on this weird exploration while I'm kind of looking outward at the cosmos, it's also encouraged me to look inward. Mm -hmm. And it's made me think about sort of the beauty out there and kind of the the bigness of the universe kind of makes me appreciate my place in it. And and that is to say that it's a it's a big cosmic beach. It's lots of grains of sand out there, and I'm but one little speck on that that cosmic beach. But I'm also a speck that exists, and a speck on that on that sand and that cosmic beach that has existed at the same time as a Dave Schrader and a Bruce Springsteen and a David Bowie and a Jim Henson and a uh, you know a, a George Lucas and and people that have had an immense influence on my life. Some I've met, some I haven't met, but I've still been influenced by. And then when you start kind of thinking about it in those terms, it allows you to tap into this kind of calm of like, all right, this is cool. Sure, there's stressful moments, there's anxiety-inducing moments, there's anguish, but you also can find that zen, I guess, through the cosmos, you know? Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Have you had that moment where it's like, oh, yeah. this, this was a pursuit and an interest in everything, the paranormally unexplained. And then that became a job, but it also did it start forming your philosophy in that way. Let's get real weird. What if we're living life in reverse? We just don't know it. What if the reason that we have all those fascinations as a child is because that's the life that we already led. Mm. And it's just a, re a, a reverse reflection of what it is. Uh, I know I should have told everybody to clean their bong for this part of the conversation, <laughs> but, but seriously, I mean, you know, you said we feel compelled, we feel drawn. What if we're not, what if we're giving too much credit? What if this is who we were meant to be? This was what it was supposed to be. This is the destination. Uh, you know, listen, I should have been dead a, probably a dozen times by now. Things that should have taken me out that did not. And I knock wood that I continue with that luck. But then I, I look and I, I think when I'm, at, when I'm at my darkest and my most down moments, I all of a sudden I get emails from people from around the world that just reignite a fire in me that remind me, oh yeah, I do, I do matter. As weird as it is, I matter. And I, I've had an impact. And that's huge. You know, there's... There's that great scene in the movie, Mr. Destiny, which is a, basically a reimagining of It's a Wonderful Life. And Michael Caine is talking to Jim Belushi. And Belushi blames all of his life's life being thrown off because he missed that one catch in baseball or missed the home run, whatever it was. And Michael Caine says, look, if you just remove this one pebble, think, and he goes, look how it's going to redirect how your life went. And I think that's really important to, to take note of because people that want paranormal experiences but are are hiding behind a wall of fear may have had experiences their whole life but unable to identify them as such and when you remove the fear and you remove the things that limit you remarkable things can and will happen in your world and in your life whether it's seeing ufos which I've seen, whether it's seeing ghosts and having experiences, which I've seen, or, or whether it's 
getting the job that you dreamed of as a child. I think that these things exist in a way that we bring them into our world or we are drawn to the things that we were meant to be. And I think that's that's really what the beauty of life is. And that when you feel the most broken, that's usually the beginning of a new start for you. That is usually, uh, okay, now that we've cleared away all of your past and we've cleared away all of what you thought you were, wait till you see what comes out next. And that's what I've seen time after time after time. I can't listen to my original radio shows. I'm very NPR and so in my own head about what I was doing that I missed opportunities. And it wasn't until two years into my show when I started letting Dave be Dave that I flourished and, and opportunities opened for me and I got out of my own way. And I think that's an important lesson for people that no matter what walk of life you're in, whether you're interested in the paranormal or not, is just having that opportunity to allow yourself to be you and accept that good and bad are going to happen, right? But again, there's another pro. You said sci-fi. Maybe they're tapping into something. How about you take the good, you take the bad, you take them both, and there you have the facts of life. They wrote it in a theme song, and that's all true. It's all up to you. You just have to find it within yourself to keep going. And, and nobody, find the reason. Yeah. Nobody ever, I mean, and then different strokes for different folks, which is where That's Mrs. Right. Garrick originated from. So exactly. <laughs> the, I, I, I mean, you talk about it's, um, you know, you mentioned about living life in reverse and in the book, you do have this one story of a haunting. I won't give too much of a way, a, a haunting or some sort of activity in a house where basically a man encounters himself, a version of, of himself, either a future ghost version of himself, a time slip, a doppelganger, whatever it might be. That's a strange one. And and I love it. And I, I find that it's a, a a topic that people kind of, not just the doppelganger, but the weirdness, the overall high strangeness seems to be coming up more and more in conversation and not just amongst paranormal groups, but in mainstream, on TikTok, on, in, on social media and whatnot. It feels to me like there is this paradigm shift where we're moving away from the strict definition of a ghost is X, Y, Z, and this is the nature of the cosmos. Do you agree? And then if so, I guess from more of the job side of it, what would it take to see those kinds of stories on tv whatever tv is now i mean because it, it just doesn't seem like the entertainment element is w is willing to respond to what the public is talking about and responding to it's a razor line you're asking me to walk right now because obviously uh both of us working in tv i'm what i'm about to say is going to shit on the industry but the big problem is is that there's not enough innovative thinkers that are putting things into action there are the Guillermo del Toros that are creating, but they're doing it against a pushback, right? One of, one of the most interesting lessons to me came from George Romero as I stood outside of a Chicago movie theater as he had a cigarette during a screening of The Night of the Living Dead. And I looked at him, and this was after the remake of Dawn of the Dead had come out, and nobody else was there, man. Again, I willed this moment into existence. It's me and George Romero standing outside the movie theater having a smoke and a talk, just two guys, not a fan and a director, just two guys, even though we were talking about the interest in this. And I said, so when are we going to see soon? Are we going to see a Day of the Dead remake or an original George Romero zombie movie? And he shook his head and he said, there's already one that's been made of Day of the Dead. And you want to know the funny thing, Dave? I've asked eight to $12 million to make a new Romero movie that they say, oh, I don't think so, but they'll spend 20 to 35 million to remake my movies. So that said something so profound to me about history and about uh, entertainment. Everybody's afraid to take that first step until somebody else proves it's real, right? Until somebody else proves that uh, it can work. And you, it's always these fringe elements. Look at how many of these amazing TV shows that lasted 10, 12 seasons that we find out were really poor in their first year, but Les Moonves or you know one of the higher ups believed in the project enough to say, let's give them another season. And then they exploded, right? So there's not enough of that kind of thinking out there right now. There's a lot of cookie cutter 
and everybody's afraid to break the mold. You know, I was saying years ago when I would watch ghost adventures and ghost hunters, the episodes when they had fun and they weren't just all puffed out chests in a dark room being tough asses, when they would laugh and have a, a, a genuine moment, I would watch social media explode at how people love that. And when producers would come to me and go, do you have an idea? I'd be like, yeah, you're going to take Dave Schrader and Aaron Sagers. You're going to put us in a car and we're going to go do this, do that. And we're going to show the humor of what we do so that when we hit the scary moments, they're even scarier. Because if through the whole episode, you're just slowly elevating them to fear and we get to those fearful moments and then we take them to the next, nobody gets a chance to relax. And if you take them on a journey and they can laugh and learn along with Dave and Aaron, and then something scary happens, it's more frightening because it came out of nowhere. And then we allow it to go back to us being human, not just one moment after the other. And no, nobody wants to see that, but we do want to do a show about demons. Would you consider being an exorcist? And I'm like, be an exorcist. I don't just, you don't just be an exorcist. Uh, <laughs> that's not how it's done. And, and a lot of the problems with the TV world was that the producers want entertainment. They think they understand what that is. But what they're saying is what we really want is for you to take the reality of what you do and become a TV persona on a scripted TV show. I was very, very thankful that the production company, when I did get the opportunity to step into the big boy chair and be the lead investigator, I was so thankful that I was finally allowed to just be the investigator and not have a protocol that I had to follow. Not, not there, nothing was written for me. Nothing was said. The only parts is, Oh, Hey, you're going to go talk to Aaron Sagers, who is a historian for the town. Make sure you do ask him these three questions. Cause we do need a soundbite about this. The rest of it is just be Dave. And a lot of times the three questions they wanted me to ask, we never even got to because I came up with better questions that got better answers from the guests. And I love that these shows allowed me to flourish and be who I wanted to be and do those things. And I never felt pushed or scripted in any way, shape or form. But had I started out years ago, I don't know that that is the case. I have friends with every one of these different people from the different paranormal shows. And they tell me there's nothing scripted about their shows. There's nothing acted. I'm going to believe them for that because they're friends. They're people I care about. Um, and I, I trust in and believe, but you know, there's, there's different elements to each one of these programs. So unfortunately I don't think we're going to see any major jumps. What's going to happen is like the kids from project fear destination fear was taken off the air although successful, but because of monetary constraints to the Discovery Networks, because of their purchase of Warner Brothers HBO, they had to cut a lot of things, including major motion pictures, so that they could afford to do the things that they needed to do and to build their conglomeration. So Project Fear took it upon themselves to recreate what TV is and build their own show. And I think showing the success of things like that, networks are going to take notice. And we might get to see a renaissance again where we get a chance to come out and be more us as opposed to what people expect us to be on these yeah. TV shows. That's, I mean, that's what I hope. I would, I would say that the networks, everybody wants something new, but they don't want to be the first one to do it, as you said. Right. And then I would say that when... I talk about Dave Schrader as the TV personality. Probably my frequently repeated phrase is I'm like, I just wish we could see the the true Dave Schrader, you know, mm -hmm. like as in the humor, the we we have seen more of it with, with each subsequent project. We've seen a little bit more of it and we've seen more of uh, the the parent, Dave, you know, the dad, Dave Schrader. We've seen that more, but more of the humor so that way when crap gets real and hits the fan we see the serious element and then it's funny even like the road trip thing like i how many i you you're in a pitch meeting and you're like yeah so we're gonna be doing this riding around the country and check out weird stuff maybe it's ufo maybe it's a ghost or whatever no no, no we're just not we're not looking at a, a a travel element or or people just really prefer the ghosts right now and and it's like Did you just go find demons yeah and i'm yeah. like but what if there's a really great story we don't know about and what if aaron and i go into town looking for uh the melon heads of millville and yeah. they go, that's not even the scary one, Dave. Did you ever hear about the goblins that atta attacked this old 
deal. There's, there's newspaper articles and nobody talks about that story. And we go back and find that story. That to me is so compelling. But yeah, a lot of shows, they want you to be a ghost show, a Bigfoot show, or an alien show. Or a psychic show. Some sort of payoff. Some yeah. sort of like, you know, the, well, what's the hook? What's the payoff at the end? That It's like, well, you know, a lot of stories don't always have like that final payoff. There's the big or, question mark. But the payoff is sometimes in, like you said earlier in tonight's program, hearing what the person has to believe or share, because that gives us so much more insight into the human element and gives us context for ideas and beliefs. And, you know, it'd be real easy for you and I to be sitting in an old cafe in, in BF Egypt, uh, United States, and, and we're talking to some toothless fella about his experience with Bigfoot. And whereas you and I could be giving each other the side eye and the smirk, seeing the tear roll down his cheek as he tells us this story because of how deeply it impacted him can give you many different elements in that, in that exact same moment that maybe there's no payout. We don't get to go to that spot and see where this boy was beaten nearly to death by a Bigfoot, but we hear the story and the impact it had on this kid's life. And now this man's life and Uh, To me, I think that's gold. I think in the stories, and that's why I love doing books like I just did. It's it's sharing that element that a lot of people might have overlooked because it wasn't glamorous enough. It wasn't it wasn't polished enough. But I think in the the real world, things can still be impactful without having a ta-da, the butler did it moment. It could just be left open with, and I don't know what the hell that experience was, but I know I'll never be the same. Yeah, that human element, which again is what's on display in the book Theater of the Mind. I'm I'm gonna wrap up, but I I have to ask, like now that you've done this, you've alluded to the fact that you have more volumes of the of Theater of the mm-hmm. Mind. Has this made you want to write any fiction? I mean, God knows you've consumed a lot of pop culture. You want to write a entirely scripted tale? I I've written and I've created a couple of books, um, but I I fall into that same issue uh, with my own personality and my own insecurities which is weird when you realize i just got done telling you i've willed into life all of these things i i I have to take these baby steps i've created some novels and some things that i'd like to get out there eventually and maybe if this book does well and another couple of these books do well that'll encourage me enough to continue and when i hear from people and you know what's really sweet to me is um First of all, if you purchase the book, you can purchase it directly off my website at paranormal60.com and get a signed copy. If you're anywhere else in the world, you can order it from Amazon. It won't be signed, but you can get it there. I just ask one favor, and that's to rate and review the book. Because every rating and review that goes out there for these works by myself or any other author exposes more readers to it. Because the more Amazon sees an interest in this book, the more they'll make that book available to a wider audience or suggest, oh, you've bought Aaron Sager's book of supernatural stories. Uh, you know, Here's another book you might find interesting. So that really does help out. So please consider rating and reviewing the book if you pick it up. Um, but reading some of those reviews, some of the reviews are by the people whose stories are featured in here anonymously. And that really touched me that they got a copy of the book. They didn't even ask for one. They just went out and bought a copy, read it. And they're like, this book is amazing. I love this. You really gave life to these stories. And then them sending me screen caps of their their uh, published review of the story. And that's really touched me that they felt like I, they gave it to the right person who treated it with respect and love and released it out there in a way that they feel safe having it shared. So I hope people will take, take that into account when they're reading the book as well. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh well, I, I hope you do. I, I know that this book is, it's a, it's jam packed with stories and yet it is a fast read because mm-hmm. you're just kind of you're drawn in and you you kind of go through it quickly and dave's copy that he's holding on camera is in better shape than mine because i also was reading mine at disney world uh in front of the haunted mansion and during a rainstorm so it made for great reading but terrible treatment of the book <laughs> so, <laughs> but, but it's a cop it's a compliment that i'm at the haunted mansion and i'm reading a book of spooky and creepy stories by dave schrader and uh with know, that's... The, the funny the funny bit real quick you said that you know i think there's 15 stories in there yeah I'm, one of them is mine specifically but my original plan for this was it was going to be um 
Tales to Scare the Shit Out of You, The Paranormal Bathroom Reader. And I just thought each story is a good sit down, right? It's a good moment to stop scrolling and and give you a, a moment for pause. So, I, And then when I sent this to Greg Lawson, our buddy, he said, dude, this book is going to be great in about 15 evacuations. So uh, he got the point of it. But I figured let's class it up a little bit. And instead of making it the bathroom reader, we'll just call it Theater of the Mind, Tales from the Darkness. Each book will have a, a Theater of the Mind and some other little title to it. But I, yeah, like I said, I'd like to put out four or five of these. Well, I, I would connect it to, uh, although Bathroom Reader works fine, um, <laughs> but I would connect it to, from my childhood, Scary Stories to Tell in the Dark. Um, the, you know, remember the book, great illustrations, spooky illustrations, and then these very tight stories. Now, those were based on urban legends and whatnot and and they were campfire stories but this is very evocative of that because these are all stories that kind of go through in a couple pages and you're creeped out and even more so uh, unsettled at times because they are true stories from listeners and then from yourself there's two from you in the book right and um yeah I be- yeah i believe so yeah there's two and or one that's sort of like you setting it up and yeah, so it's it's like scary stories to tell in the dark, but true scary stories to tell in the dark, which is, you know, I think really part of the appeal. So uh, my friend, before I let you go, first off, I'm, I'm greatly appreciative of your time and I'm so excited about this book. I'm glad that you have brought this out, put this out in the universe. How can people just overall follow your work, keep up with you, stay in touch and just support? Dave? At paranormal60.com is my email. Uh, if you go to paranormal60, paranormal60.com, you'll find all of my information there. And uh, wherever you subscribe to podcasts, you can find the Paranormal 60. And what I've done with that is built a nice little network. So not only do you get my show twice a week, but uh, on Mondays, we release New England Legends with Jeff Belanger and Ray Osher. On Tuesdays, Paranormal 60. Wednesdays is the Monsters Lounge podcast. Thursdays, the Paranormal 60 News. And Fridays, True Hauntings from Australia. The two friends of ours, Ann and Renata, host a show where they examine true hauntings around the world. So it's kind of a great little network that gives you a full variety of different style of topics and uh, different styles of hosts. So there should be something for everybody there. Uh, or you can go to the Paranormal 60 YouTube channel, subscribe, it's free. You'll find all my episodes there, especially if you click under the live tab, you'll see all the live ones. There's different tabs on there. So there's different shows that were some were live, some were just put up. So there's a lot to, to go through. I think we're season three of that show and we're about 224 episodes in right now. So there's a lot of content from a lot of great guests Right on. And you'll be able to see him at a lot of events over this upcoming year and check those out. uh, Find out where you could see Dave also through, I guess, the Paranormal 60 website. Well, yeah. Or go to darknessevents.com, darknessevents.com. I'm putting up all the places I'll be this year, investigating the claims of the paranormal, doing presentations, meeting and greeting signing copies of my book so there's i'm going to be all over the united states and england this year so hopefully you get a chance so if you want to get off the couch and get into the game and actually go out and investigate darknessevents.com and if you want to travel with me over to england in september to not only get to visit some of the most haunted places you also get to attend a paranormal conference with the festival of the unexplained it's a three or four day conference we're going to stop in for and i'll be a speaker it's the only time you'll see shane uh, Shane Pittman, Cindy Keza, and myself from the Holzer Files together in Europe. So it's a cool opportunity to do that. Um, so there's a lot of great opportunities to get out there and actually become part of the paranormal in a safe way. Right on. Well, thank you, my friend, for your time. And always, once again, my guest is Dave Schrader. His new book, Theater of the Mind, Tales from the Darkness, it is available now on Amazon and through his site directly where you can get an autographed copy. I do recommend you check it out. And I'm Aaron Sagers. This has been Talking Strange. And until next time, be kind, stay spooky, and keep it weird.